I lost, I, you were a beautiful, beautiful painter. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought you were going to say baby for a minute. I actually won a beauty contest when I was grade two, uh, two years old for little girls. And then my mother ripped a diaper off of me and showed my penis to everybody. But that was a great joke. They let her keep me away. I showed a picture <laughs> if I could find it. You'll like it. I really you will. like that. Yeah, you'll like it. Help me up like this and rip my diaper off. My mother sent me down. She's the boy I pulled you. Most beautiful little boy girl ever. So are you self-taught as an artist? And when did you begin no, painting? No, I learned from everybody. I could all the time. Nothing less than everything all the time. I'm picking it up 24-7. I take the low place and I let it all flow down into me, every last little bit of it. To me, my definition of originality is it's an index of how much you've been able to allow life to influence you. It's not a matter of protecting your little pristine creative monadic juices in a magic circle of condom and touch me nots. You know? You'll atrophy sooner enough that way. You'll shrink, you'll you'll evaporate, you tidal pool inspiration, you know, all those little claws and mandibles and that little minnow fish swimming or a little silver fish. That's all. The first big wave is going to wipe you right out into the big, bad, dangerous sea. And then let's see if you can swim or not, guppy. Yeah? I'd say that describes your poetic process aptly, but I was asking specifically about painting. Mm -hmm. And Picture music. There's no damn difference anymore in my world. There are two waves of water for the same thing. You know? As I said before, you can see the sound. You can hear the color. So it becomes picture music, and there's this, this kind of harmonic weld whereby you can no longer separate them anymore than you can the moon's reflection from water. They become that closely bound. So I don't try, you know. So as a little boy, you were painting then as well? Oh, yeah. I have an artist mother. She was an Australian portrait painter uh, who came over to Canada on Arts Fellowship with my great-grandmother, or my grandmother, rather, and ended up in Victoria and uh, giving it all up to raise me, you know, for, for which I'll never be able to repair her. Uh, we bought endless tubes of paint that went into blue te steamer trunks in the basement for a day that would never come. Bottles of evening pair of Paris perfume and stuff like this. You know? She used to dance ballet as well as, uh, as paint and ferociously so. Somewhat the same way I write. You my did? My mother. My, my, mother, my, my did. mother, yeah. Huh. And my sister is uh, my, the eldest of my two sisters, a, a raging award-winning poet when she was 18 on the West Coast, doing things that people before her had never done before the age of 47, and then throwing it all away, throwing it all back in their face with disgust, you know, doing whatever she wanted, and whenever she wanted, no matter what. Tank of a woman who went through life, just get out of my way or lock me up. It's your choice, I don't care. I'm going this way, you know? And uh, hopefully still so, some of the same. My, my younger Do you have sister, a good rapport with her? We, we, we did when we were younger. There's, I was littered, I wasn't raised in a nuclear family. I was really, really littered by these big, beautiful bitch wolf who didn't stand for nonsense, but knew how to love and cuddle too, you know? And uh, so it's just not like, I can't remember sitting down at the same table as my family, but half a dozen times in my whole life. Was there a big age no difference? No member of my family has ever attended reading of mine, even when I give one out in Victoria. And that's true. My mother attended a, a party, there were three parties for me when the last time I returned, uh, with Gary Geddes, who's Habitable planets, you know, selected in hand from Cormorant Books, arranged the tour for me. And I went out there, and I was at a party, and it was a party for the undergraduate students, and then there was a party for the graduate students, and then there was a party for the profs, right? Delicious food and gaiety, and they asked me, I had a few friends show up and stuff like this. And my mother had never been to one of these events before, was astounded by all these important people, you know, milling about over her son, you know. Uh, who thinks she looks at and accepts, but always has a kind of quizzical pathos in her eyes when she looks at me like I gave birth to that. I guess I'm going to have to acknowledge it. And she, she, she turned to me and said, uh, somewhat hurtfully as well, Patty, what are you doing that all these pe important people are paying attention to? You? And my response was, shut up and eat, Mom. It doesn't last forever. You know? And that's my family's total involvement with my literary career, other than counting books and happy for me that I've got another book published. They know I'm, something's going on here with this guy. And my mother constantly, whenever I get a new book, says, Patty, write a novel. <laughs> it throws cold water all over my lyrical, you know, cock a doodle -doos. And so I've written two novels. And, and uh, well, well, the last one called Witching for Water and Hell was a serious literary attempt to write a novel that just came upon me. So, so uh, it's, it's not obeying my mommy. But I have obeyed my mommy novelistically. It's enough to satisfy her and me that... 
I'm at the strict shit, you know, and love has got to make its own way in the world. Did she read it? My mother, no, I never sent it out to her. I just told her I finished it. She reads voluminously. She, my mother reads about a book a day, I used to remember her reading. She probably doesn't anymore, but she'd be in bed at 8 o'clock, and the book would be done by midnight, and then she'd be done, and up in the morning again, and start it all over again. Everything under the sun. Her big event for me, her big influence on me was growing up poor in a really bleak, dismal neighborhood with not much stimulation other than knives and hammers, freaks and perverts, you know, people standing under your window peeping toms. And in Victoria? In Victoria. There was a little area where, where Victoria is a very subtle place. It's very beautiful in that. But if you're born there and you're, and you're, you're Yugoslav or you're Italian or you're native Indian or you're, you're any other ethnicity other than white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you know, and you're poor, that's okay. It's because you're part of the colonies, you know. But but if you're white, and it, this takes you 20 years to, to learn this, and you're poor, and you're white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and you're poor, there's an extra little hit that goes, God must hate you. Because he makes all white Anglo-Saxon Protestants that are good rich. And he curses the ones that aren't. But it took a long time before for that little nuance to manifest itself. You know, I couldn't believe it, you know. Uh, so that, you know, being poor and under the white angle was a sin, not just an economic condition, mm. you know. But it was bleak and it was lean and it was mean and a lot of violence and a lot of, you know, atrocious inanities, you know, tragic comedy of, farcical comedy of human lust and love and every other perversity under the world in that neighborhood. So raised in a snake pit, but, but it's an interesting one and it certainly teaches a young writer to keep his eyes open observe human nature, which I did. And I observed my mother's as well. I had total access to my mother. I was a middle-aged man when I was seven years old because there was no TV in the house. And the only thing you did was sit around in the kitchen at night and look at the greasy linoleum and the grease on the floors and listen to my grandmother and mother talk about everything under the sun. Embittered women, you know, fighting for, you know, washing floors now, ballerinas and bleach, you know? So you learn, you know? and. And, and after a while, the walls come down. Your mother starts talking to you like you're not seven years old anymore. She's not shocking on your mind or anything like that. She's just being herself and letting her own grief and worry and anxiety out because you're, you're the affable familiar that she's got to walk beside, you know, and accompanying her to pawn her wedding ring and having a sense of what that meant to her, but knowing she had to do it, you know, and all of that. And trying to be a good elf, you know. Thief of flowers for her. I used to steal geraniums out of people's yards, marigolds. All kinds of stuff. I'd, 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 I'd case the yard, I'd grab my wagon, you know, I'd go up two or three blocks. All these flowers would be standing at clockwork attention, military style, the guy's yard had gone to work. Well, my mom would have all the holes dug in the house, eh? yeah, around the house. Usually an old dump, we were trying to put some flowers in, so it was tolerably visual. And uh, and I went around the corner with my hot little wagon of stolen flowers, and she'd be checking them in the holes, <laughs> covering them up like they'd always been growing. Oh, many, many times over, yeah. That and checking out all the wild abandoned orchard fields around Victoria back in those days, you know, a lot of broom and uh, coming home with wads of wildflowers that she'd plant in the yard and stuff and trying to make a lawn in the backyard, mountains of the moon and stuff like this, you know, and building houses. And we'd get the damn place built and cleaned and it'd be looking spanky and a slumlord would sell it underneath. You know, we appreciated the value of the property by 10 grand time to sell, go on to the next dump and do it all over again, you know. But you're involved with plants, and you know, out in Victoria, a little Sandwich Peninsula, you know, like we'd all pile on the buses at five in the morning, cold, chilly mornings, and go out and pick Logan berries and daffodils and uh, every berry under the sun with the with the Chinese woman who seemed to be able to sit on their haunches all day, you know, and didn't bother them. You know, eight hours a day for two or three bucks, you know, a bunch of well, woman with her four kids and her grandmother going out trying to buy bread and stuff like this with it. You know, you get to know plants and stuff. How could you not? Was there a big age difference between yourself and your older sisters? We're all spaced about a year, year and a half apart. And I'm the eldest, and it goes down the chain. The eldest is me, and then there's Kathy, my sister. Ah. And there's my sister, Zara. And then my youngest brother, gigantic younger brother, Jesse. You know? So there's boy bookends, um, two girls. You know, Had nothing to do with me. You know, uh, Really ruptured uh, relationship between my mother and father. And, atrociously, violently, unforgivably so, you know, it was, it was like 
standing in the middle of a napalm attack in Vietnam when you're seven. Like that little girl in the film that comes out with her, all her clothes off and her skin burned and stuff. It was like that until finally the best thing my father ever did to me, and this probably sounds cruel, is leave. Just disappear. Go away. You know? Go ut abius. Go away. I give so that you go away. You know? You know? You know, you know, and, and, and he did. He exercised himself with a lot of help from the Mounties and rubber chests. Never saw him again. Um, when I was about 47, 48, my mother started crying when she was in the mall out there. My, my daughter was with her. And Jody quite rightfully asked, what's wrong? And uh, she said, that's the kid's father, you know? And he was living six doors down from his youngest son in Victoria with neither of them realizing they were father and son. They walked past each other every day. And I went to call him. You know, it's a gray blank. I was flying through the Rockies once with a, uh, a woman I was living with. And, and just spontaneously out of my mouth, I said, Dad. You know? She said, what do you mean, Dad? It was pure gray, milky cloud cover. I said, that's what I see in my mind when I say that word, Father. It's just a blank slate, like one of those things you lift up and the print disappears off. And, uh, and so I was, I was biographically curious. What's your story, man? You know? Why did you wreak hell on us all? You know, we never hurt you. We, we tried to love you, but you're in, you wouldn't let anybody love you, and you wouldn't love anybody in return either. So what's your story? Why all this stuff? Mad at your dad? What? You know? You know, did the whip go wrong? And uh, I went to call him, and I had the number, and damn it if I didn't turn into a seven-year-old boy again, being thrown across the kitchen to smuck my chin up against the kitchen cupboard, you know? And I just thought, of hell with you. Click! <laughs> you know? You know? And uh, I got my mom, you know, she's all of it, you know, so, you know, that's my mom, and I damn well love her to bits, you know. Well, she doesn't completely understand me. I love the fact that she does accept me. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know? so, so what were you like as a little boy? Did you mingle well with other students at Oh, yeah, school? I did. I always had an affable gift, yeah, when I was seven. I think I became a writer when I was seven in Campbell River when... Uh, my mother had had a miserable day, and she was ha burning stuff in the fire out in the yard, and and uh, I decided to help by taking the fuel can from under the leaking oil drum and throwing it all over the fire. I understood this much physics when I was probably about six in a snowsuit or something. You know, kaboosh! And it's <laughs> 40 feet up the branch and burned. My hands are scalded. And she startled, you know, her nerves were on edge. And she was washing the dishes, and for one of the only times in her life she ever she ever even came close to hurting me physically. She just turned and whipped a plate at me, which broke and scarred my ankle, and she was just crushed by that act, and uh, it was okay. It wasn't like it didn't traumatize me or make me feel like I'm, you know, gonna see shrinks for the rest of life. It's just, you know, after the day she's had, <laughs> it's lucky she didn't use a Glock 9 on me or something, you know? And uh, so I felt that way about it, and and uh, I went and wandered around town later just saying, you know, uh, you know, my mommy's sad. She doesn't have any food, you know, like, and uh, in the morning we woke up and it was a wraparound veranda around this place, eh? And I'm sure I exaggerated as you do as a child, remember, uh, as, a, as an adult remembering back on child. So it's probably a little mythic inflation in this, but I don't really think much. It was just stacked with boxes of food from the town people who came in the night. Oh, that's And really just put all this food on. And I made a connection between this and reality right away. And I don't think I've ever lost that connection. And I've used it for charities, for helping people that are in bad jams, not just, not just poetry. Uh, poetry is a way of life. It includes all of life, not just words on a page. Uh, or you're going to be a really mediocre poet, let me tell you. You've got to take that low place. The C is the poem, and you let everything flow down into it, including yourself eventually, you know, or dead or alive. Oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> Anyways, you know, that's been poetry for me, basically. Uh, the, the rhythm of, of course, it's got all kinds of little side melodies and, and you know, lyrical eddies and currents swirling around in it. You always have variety going on. But that's the main thrust of the mind stream, I would say, and still is.